I'm Kennedy. I'm Bill Hemmer. I'm Sandra Smith, and this is the Fox News Rundown. Wednesday, April 26th, 2023. I'm Dave Anthony. There's a growing concern. More than a year after the U.S. pulled out of Afghanistan, it could again be a terror safe haven. Well, now we have no troops, no troops within thousands of miles of Afghanistan. And so you can only imagine how much harder it is to determine where these terrorists are and what they might be doing. I'm Jessica Rosenthal. Polling reveals Republicans want to fight so-called woke ideology. But one woman at the center of the transgender debate says she's not fighting to hold back one group. She just wants to defend another. It's important to highlight to the general public exactly what the Biden administration is doing and the exact message they're sending to girls and women, because that message is that they don't matter, their feelings doesn't matter, their safety, their privacy, their dignity, their equal opportunities don't matter. And I'm Jimmy Fallon. I've got the final word on the Fox News Rundown. Could Afghanistan become what it once was? The terrorists did not get the memo that Joe Biden wanted the war on terror to be over. Republican Congressman Mike Waltz tells Fox he's worried that despite the U.S. spending 20 years there after 9-11, Afghanistan may again become a safe haven. The thing that's worse is they've made a deal with the devil with the Taliban and want us to believe that we can depend on the not so bad terrorists to help us go after ISIS. Though yesterday we learned the Taliban has killed the senior leader of the Islamic State group in Afghanistan who was behind the attack during the August 2021 U.S. withdrawal. The bombing outside the crowded airport in Kabul that killed 13 American troops and 170 Afghans. But still, the Washington Post reports the recent leaks of classified U.S. intelligence show ISIS-K in Afghanistan is plotting terror attacks against America, as well as in Europe and in Asia, and wanting to learn how to make chemical weapons. At a House hearing last week, the Inspector General for the Department of Defense, Robert Storch, testified the U.S. misjudged the situation in Afghanistan. The U.S. supported Afghan government and military collapsed almost immediately as U.S. forces began their final withdrawal from the country, resulting in a more rushed and contested non-combatant evacuation. And he said the war was a strategic failure. Well, we're basically nowhere because we have almost no influence whatsoever over Afghanistan because we pulled everyone out. Congressman Seth Moulton is a Democrat on the House Armed Services Committee. Look, this was a bipartisan decision. I mean, Trump wanted to pull everyone out of Afghanistan. Biden made it happen. But as a result, we have no presence in the country, almost zero influence over the Taliban. And we actually still have a lot of interests in the area, not least of which is preventing it from becoming another terrorist breeding ground for a potential attack on the United States. But that may be happening, right? I mean, we, we, we know of the report of the possibilities of attacks being plotted, but how much can we possibly find out without much on the ground? It's very difficult, and that's one of the problems. It's very difficult to, to know what's going on. You might recall that uh, during or just after the evacuation, uh, we conducted an airstrike in Kabul to try to take out some terrorists. It ended up taking out a poor Afghan family. And I bring that up because the point is that even when we had troops at the airport, just a few miles away, it was difficult to determine where the terrorists were. And we ended up making a horrible, tragic mistake. Well, now we have no troops, no troops within thousands of miles of Afghanistan. And so you can only imagine how much harder it is to determine where these terrorists are and what they might be doing. Now, you, you, you reference what happened in the you know, withdrawal, August of 2021. You went there. You saw it. And, and, I, and I read a report that, that you had said that even if you completely agree with the decision to withdraw, the way this was handled has been a total disaster. What did you see? So Representative Peter Meyer and I went. We're both veterans. Uh, both have spent time living actually on our own out in Afghanistan, probably the only two in Congress who've done that. And of course, it's bipartisan. He's a Republican and I'm a Democrat. And at the time, there was no congressional oversight 
of that withdrawal whatsoever. We had no idea what was even going on. So he and I went over, got on the ground, actually helped a number of our Afghan allies get out, save their lives. But perhaps even more importantly, we learned what was happening. We learned what the U.S. was doing, what they were doing right, what they were doing wrong. What we witnessed was absolutely extraordinary in what these U.S. Marines were doing. I mean, wading out into this sea of humanity to find our allies and bring them to safety as many as they could before we pull up the ramps and and left town. But it was a disaster. It was chaos. And it didn't have to be that way. I had been advocating for months, sitting on the House Armed Services Committee, speaking directly with people like the Secretary of Defense and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, telling them, you've got to start this evacuation now. Don't wait till the end. Start it now. And if we had done that, well, it still might have been a disaster, but not nearly of the epic proportions that it was. Yeah, we lost 13 U.S. troops in the bombing that happened amid all that chaos in the crowd at the airport. You think that was preventable? They had to do that because there was no orderly evacuation in the months prior, because we didn't go through with getting these people out when we had the troops on the ground, the resources, the additional airfields to do it reasonably, to to do it uh, smoothly. You had said that it was a disaster. Now, of course, the White House came out with their report blaming much of the chaos on President Trump. And, you know, he had had the deal with the Taliban negotiated and, and had agreed to have U.S. troops withdraw. But, of course, you know, both sides are blaming each other. Is, is it what do you you're a Democrat. So what do you say? Look, both sides are to blame. I think anyone who's looking at this seriously understands that uh, Trump should never have negotiated with the Taliban. And, and when he did negotiate with them, he sold the store. I mean, he gave so much of our leverage away. But I think it's also unfair for the Biden administration to just blame this all on Trump, because we all know that President Biden has changed a lot of things that Donald Trump did. So why didn't he change these things? Why didn't he take the responsibility that he had as commander in chief to run this evacuation responsibly? All right, Congressman, I wanted to go back to that hearing in the House last week, the testimony that got a lot of attention that was $8 billion in USA to Afghanistan since the withdrawal. I want you to hear some of what was said. Unfortunately, as I sit here today, I cannot assure this committee or the American taxpayer we are not currently funding the Taliban. John Sopko, he's the Special Inspector General for Afghan Reconstruction, and he said this. I haven't seen a starving Taliban fighter on TV. They all seem to be fat, dumb, and happy. I see a lot of starving Afghan children on TV. So I'm wondering where all this funding is going. And he said that he's not getting cooperation in his oversight from USAID and the State Department. You've obviously heard those words. You've seen the reports. What's your reaction? I'm not surprised. I mean, I mean, this is what happens. Let's put this in perspective. For 20 years in Afghanistan, there was a lot of graft. Uh, there was a lot of aid being siphoned off and sent to the wrong sources. I'm sure there were Taliban in Afghanistan even when we were there who were benefiting from U.S. aid. But of course, it wasn't the majority. You know, we had troops on the ground. We had State Department officials on the ground. U.S. aid, Americans on the ground in country to supervise this distribution of aid as much as possible. And, and that's simply not possible anymore. But let's also recognize that this is an unbelievably difficult problem that would have existed had Trump pulled us out, just as it exists now with Biden. We don't want poor Afghan kids to starve. So we want to give them a chance at getting this aid, and that's why we're providing it. So did we fail? All those Afghan Congress, Look, all did we fail the war this 20 years? Is it all a failure then? It's not all a failure because I'm sure that those Afghan girls who got to go to school for five or 10 years are incredibly grateful to the U.S. troops who risked their lives to make that possible. And we're grateful back in America that for 20 years there was not a terrorist attack on the United States that came from Afghanistan. There was a lot of good that came from Americans being there despite the extraordinary cost in taxpayer dollars and in American lives. But I'm still upset by the way it ended. 
Now, Sopko, the inspector general, also spoke about visas to Afghans who helped or they fought with the U.S. during the war. And he, and he says they face insurmountable burdens trying to document their work with the U.S. They can't get out. And in some cases, they've been either killed or arrested. The Taliban getting retaliation for what they did while the U.S. was there. How are we going to help them? What are we going to do better? This is a moral travesty, and it and it and it's like a dagger in the heart for every American soldier, Marine, airman, sailor who's on the ground and promised these Afghan allies, promised them that if they risked their lives to work with us, we would have their backs. We would get them to safety if they needed it and if we left. And, and as the latest figures available, about 175,000 Afghans are still waiting for the U.S. government to process their special immigrant visas to come here. And there are so many veterans, by the way, like myself, who are working tirelessly, often staying up all night just to try to get a few of them to safety. So what do we now, do? In the meantime, how do we reform said, the process? Look, how do we let them, how do we cut the red tape and allow them to get out? And then what should we do beyond that after we get them out? So what we need to do is we need to cut through the bureaucracy. We need to get them out of Afghanistan, and if we're not 100% sure about their paperwork, then sort it out once they're out, and at least in safety, not getting hunted down by the Taliban. And if there are problems, we'll sort it out then, but get them to safety first. That's what we should have started doing a long time ago, but it's not too late to start it now. All right, Congressman, away from Afghanistan, four years ago, you were starting your campaign for president against Joe Biden. There were like a few dozen Democrats. It was a very crowded race. He just announced he's running for re-election. You're a Democrat. Do you support four more years? I do. Joe Biden has been an incredibly effective president. He's gotten so much done that's made lives better for Americans, lowered health care costs, invested in our infrastructure, a bipartisan infrastructure deal. He's helped end the COVID pandemic. He's investing in education. He's investing in our kids. He's lowering the cost of child care. I mean, he's really trying to make lives for Americans better. Of course, this is a very partisan time. Yeah. And a lot of people don't give Biden credit for what he's done. But but Democrats are very pleased with what the president's accomplished. And that's why we're all we're all lining up to support him. His critics say that what happened in Afghanistan underscores his weakness that's being taken advantage of around the world by Russia, by China. What's your reaction to that? Well, it seems like the alternative is Donald Trump. And not only our enemies, but our allies were laughing at us for four years under his presidency, making a laughing stock of the United States because of Donald Trump sitting in the White House. So elections come down to choices, and the American people have to decide. What's better, Joe Biden or likely nominee Donald Trump? That ultimately be, will be the question. And I'm confident in supporting Joe Biden. Congressman Seth Moulton, Democrat from Massachusetts, member of the House Armed Services Committee. Good to talk to you again. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Dave. This is Jimmy Fallon with your Fox News commentary coming up. A recent Wall Street Journal poll found most Republican voters think fighting woke ideology is more important than even protecting Social Security and Medicare from cuts. 55% feel this way. This may clash with a NORC poll from March. It found on issues including schools and businesses promoting racial diversity and acceptance of transgender people that majorities think the country is on the right track or not doing enough. Either way, whatever's considered woke will most certainly come up among Republican presidential candidates. If and when Florida Governor Ron DeSantis decides to run, it may even be a campaign feature. We will never surrender to the woke mob. Florida is where woke goes to die. Florida and other states have passed new rules recently that may be considered anti-woke. Some have passed rules against gender transition surgeries for minors, and some have rules banning transgender athletes from competing in girls' and women's sports. Last week, U.S. House Republicans passed a bill that would amend Title IX by banning transgender athletes from competing in women and girls' sports at schools that receive federal funding. Make no mistake, this is not a culture war. They are trying to diminish and erase who we are as women, and I will not stand for it. I'm proud to vote for this bill.
Marionette Miller Meeks is a Republican congresswoman from Iowa. Concerns around transgender athletes competing with women got increased attention when University of Pennsylvania swimmer Leah Thomas, a trans swimmer, won the NCAA championship in the 500 meter race last March. She then tied for fifth place with another swimmer in the 200 meter. Last week, the Biden administration said they want a rule that says bans on transgender folks from girls and women's sports violates Title IX. Thomas spoke out on her Instagram. This rule is a good start. However, it is not enough. During this time of intense anti-trans backlash, the trans community needs explicit protections from discrimination in order to live our lives freely and equally. But the female swimmer Thomas had to share that fifth place trophy with has been speaking out herself. There's a lots of different moving pieces, whether that be at the state level, the federal level, within specific sporting bodies. Riley Gaines is a 12-time NCAA All-American swimmer and now spokesperson for the Independent Women's Forum. So there's lots of different moving parts when I'm fighting to protect women's sports. And so it feels as if I'm everywhere, um, <laughs> but that's exactly where I want to be is anywhere and everywhere where I can be contributing to ensuring that no woman or young girl has to unfairly compete against a male-bodied athlete or share a locker room with someone of the opposite sex. And so what I've been doing a lot of these past couple months is testifying at the state legislature, like you saw in North Carolina, doing everything I can to help encourage the left-leaning representatives or delegates to understand how this is harmful to women and how this isn't something that's anti-trans or deeply rooted in hate. And I think this is something that the Republicans could do a better job of the language they use to talk about these things. I, I, I have a lot of opinions there. And so I'm doing, trying to do my best on um, communicating my message in a way that highlights how we as women are being affected and how this is unfair. You noted the House bill at the congressional level. It did pass in the House, as you noted, along party lines, but it likely will not go further than that. The Senate likely won't take it up. And the White House has said the president will veto it. I, I wonder if that leaves you at a state level for now. Like, is that the focus? I don't want to say anything until it, it doesn't go through, but I am not overly confident that it will, obviously, as most people know. But there's a lot going on with Title IX, which is, of course, a federal civil rights law. Um, the Biden administration, they have rewritten what Title IX will be. Um, and I think this will be implemented in either May or June. And this will be detrimental to women's, not only women in sports, but this would mean that men could join sororities, men could live in dorm rooms with women, men could have full access to any restroom or changing space on campus for women. Um, so there's a lot of different pieces of this new Title IX that I feel as if the general public isn't really realizing. And so I've made it my goal, while yes, I am focusing majorly on the state level in terms of passing legislature that will combat this issue, it's important to highlight to the general public exactly what the Biden administration is doing and the exact message they're sending to girls and women, because that message is that they don't matter, their feelings doesn't matter, their safety, their privacy, their dignity, their equal opportunities don't matter. Riley, when it did pass the House, the minority leader, Democrat Hakeem Jeffries, made a couple of points that we've heard from others, including that this kind of legislation it bullies trans women and girls. Um, I imagine that's not the first time you've heard that, that it's bullying to ban trans women and girls from competitions from sports. What do you say back to that? When Have you been accused of being a bully? Absolutely. I have been accused of every name in the book. Um, people will call you transphobic. They'll call you bigot. They'll call you hateful. They'll call you a racist for some reason, even though this has nothing to do with race. They will throw terms at you hoping that you'll falter from your beliefs if you're called these names. They want you to think you're guilty of committing hate speech. Hmm. But hate speech is not speech that you hate. That is not what hate speech is defined as. But that's their tactic. That's what they want to achieve. They want you to be perceived as this hateful person who has no compassion in their heart. But speaking for myself, I know that's not true. I have compassion in my heart for every single person, regardless of age, sex, gender identity, your race, regardless of who you are. I believe everyone should be entitled to sports. These bills that are being passed at both the state and federal level, um, the left loves to say that this is an anti-trans bill that bans trans youth from competing or trans athletes from competing, which is just a lie. 
Um, this is not a bill that bans anyone. Everyone is entitled fair and safe competition in these bills. And so it's hard for me to understand the problem. Um, other common misconceptions is they will say that this bill would require forced inspections of, of student athletes, which is an egregious violation of a student's personal dignity. That Again, that is not what these bills are doing. They're referring back to a birth certificate and or ensuring everyone has a routine physical before competing, which is standard, especially if you're playing at the high school, middle school, collegiate level. Uh, so there's lots of misconceptions about the bill that the left loves to push about the people who are supporting the bill that are simply not true. It does not make someone a bigot to understand that there are two sexes, to understand that you cannot change your sex, especially to diminish the advantages after you've gone through puberty, and to understand that women deserve respect and that women deserve equal opportunity. Have you personally had any conversations with trans folks who either tell you you're wrong or maybe tell you they understand why you feel the way Absolutely. you feel? Or have you reached out on your own to any transgender? Like, what have the conversations you've had been like? Absolutely, I have, especially um, I'm someone who likes to remain sensible, likes to be knowledgeable, likes to consider all perspectives. And so within this LGBTQ community, I've had so many conversations with, with members of this community. What I've noticed, a lot of people within the LGB community in regards to one's sexual orientation, not necessarily their sexual identity, they're really frustrated with this movement because they feel as if they fought for their rights. They feel as if they were finally at a place where in many places it's almost acceptable to be homosexual or to be bisexual. But they feel as if this trans movement, this gender ideology movement has hurt what they once fought for and how they have described it to me is they don't feel as if the trans community is necessarily fighting for their rights. They feel as if they're taking others rights away, which is an interesting perspective. And I think it's true by allowing trans identifying individuals into women's spaces and women's sports and women's prisons and women's shelters. We're not getting equal rights. They're taking away our rights. I've also talked to a lot of people within the trans community who understand that being a trans woman does not mean you are a biological woman. They know there's differences. They know that um, a trans woman can never get pregnant. They know that they will never have a menstrual cycle. They know that they have a different bone structure. There's a lot, of course, a lot of differences between a trans woman and a woman, and they acknowledge that. So I've had great conversations with people within the T community as well, but of course you have subsets of this um, or even just allies to this community who will do everything they can to silence you and convince you that you're wrong for feeling uncomfortable in a locker room next to a male. And that just makes you a bigot and all of these different things. So that, that community definitely goes both ways, but the amount of conversations I've had in support of my stance on this issue, and we could disagree on a lot of other things, but on this particular issue, they're very supportive and they understand. Finally, Riley, you said you think Democrats will pay for their stance on this issue in 2024. And I, I wonder, do you really think it rises to that level? I mean, we've got a lot going on, right? Inflation, the economy, worries over China, and even still many are worried about the overturning of Roe, especially in certain states. And I just wonder if you if you really do believe this issue will rise to that level of mattering in, in, when it comes time to vote. I have talked to so many women who are lifelong liberals, who are seeing how the Democrats are denying womanhood. We've now deemed it offensive to use the term mother. It's now birthing person. It's offensive to use the term breastfeeding. It's now chest feeder. Um, and these women who, again, are, are, are still relatively sensible and can understand what this means in the long run for the erasure of women, they're not okay with this. Um, and this is a hill they're willing to die on. And so I truthfully think we have this idea of feminism, what the original feminist movement was about, right. which was, of course, empowering and embracing and honoring and celebrating women based off of their own physical ceilings and their own uniqueness. Um, but now the left has totally denied that. Um, so I do think the Democrats will pay in 2024. Not one of them voted in the U.S. House of Representatives to protect women and girls in sports, which was mind-blowing because even within the Democratic Party, um, I saw a recent poll where nearly 60 to 70 percent of Democratic voters don't agree with allowing males into women's sports and spaces. And so they're clearly not representing their party 
even accurately. And Riley, one more finally for you. When you said earlier that you that you think Republicans maybe need to shift some of their language or the way they talk about this, what would you tell them to say? I think what the left does pretty well, typically, is they make things about emotion. They make things about humanity. They have this level of compassion and empathy, which appeals to a lot of people. Um, I think how the Republicans can frame the conversation around this issue in particular is the left loves to say, okay, well, what about the mental health of this athlete? I think the Republicans need to come back with, okay, but why are you neglecting the mental health of women and their self-perception rather than just continuing to say this is about fairness, This, which yes, of course, it's about fairness. Um, but there's other pieces that could make this more compassionate because in my experience, this is something that affected women in a harmful way, not just because of the unfair competition, but sharing a locker room with a male is traumatizing. Um, it makes us feel as if we're not worthy enough for fair competition. Just because we're women, we don't deserve equal opportunities. And that's that's a hard realization when you've trained your entire life for something. And so I think the Republicans could do a better job of combating this compassion with more compassion. And it's more powerful coming from the Republicans because they're speaking for the majority whereas the Democrats are speaking for the minority. Riley Gaines, thank you so much for joining us. Of course, of course. Thank you, guys. And in other news. I'm Gianna Gelosi. Millions visit U.S. national parks each year, and some don't make it home. A macabre list of the deadliest national parks has been compiled using data from the National Park Service. Park Service data shows 2,092 visitors died in national parks across the country from 2014 to 2021, most of which had undetermined causes. But vehicle crashes accounted for 415 deaths, there were over 400 drownings, and there were 385 medical deaths. Some of the most visited parks had the most amount of total deaths. Lake Mead had 145 deaths with 47 caused by drowning. The leading cause of death at the Grand Canyon was medical events, with 48 of the 97 reported deaths there. While 29 of the 80 deaths at the Great Smoky Mountains National Park were caused by car crashes. Maybe surprisingly, deaths caused by wildlife or animals were the rarest, with just five reported in that period. Two occurred at the Wrangell St. Elias National Park and Reserve. Based on death to visitor ratio, that park ranks third. Washington State's North Cascades National Park had a 0.004% mortality rate, ranking first with nine deaths between 2014 and 2021. Alaska's Lake Clark National Park and Preserve came in second. Maybe something to keep in mind when you plan your summer vacations. For the Fox News Rundown, I'm Gianna Gelosi. New from the Fox News Podcasts Network. I'm Dana Perino. Join me for season three of my limited time podcast, Everything Will Be Okay, based on my best-selling book of the same name. Make sure you subscribe to this series wherever you download podcasts and leave a rating and review. Subscribe to this podcast at foxnewspodcasts.com. It's time for your Fox News commentary. Jimmy Fallon. What's on your mind? So Joe Biden announced that he's running for re-election. Proving these days every Hollywood production gets a sequel, no matter how bad the original is. The campaign managers went with a slogan of, finish the job. But at this point, most Americans would be happy if Joe could finish a sentence. And I don't mean to harp on his lack of cognitive clarity, but the way things are going, it'd be more reckless not to. Not only does Biden shake hands with invisible people, but the dude gets lost so often leaving stage, he's the only president in history who takes more time to exit a speech than he does to give one. Now, I don't want to underestimate the guy because Biden recently said he's been to all 54 states. You can't question that determination, even if you can question his ability to count. You know, like the time he promised to bolster manufacturing by leaning into a microphone and saying, folks, I've got two words made in America. Even a community college bozo like me knows he's got that one wrong. But the reason 70 percent of Americans do not want Joe running again is not because his elevator doesn't go all the way to the top floor. It's because he's taken our country down to the basement with him. Now, is it weird that they almost never let him address the public? Yes. They promised to be the most transparent administration in history. But apparently this woke White House thinks transparent is a man who has a baby. Even so, if Biden could keep the country in one piece, we'd forgive him for having the public appearance schedule of a groundhog. 
Unfortunately, his open border policies have turned the country into that college bar that doesn't check ID. Once the word got out that anyone who shows up gets in, that's exactly what happened. Now we've hit the 5 million mark for illegal border crossings since Biden took office. Inflation's also out of control, and the only thing higher than the gas prices are the people who think Biden's energy policies are working, which is why this re-election bid feels like we're being offered a second cruise on the Titanic. They're blaming the iceberg on climate change and claiming Republicans won't fix it, but at this point, the only thing any of us cares about is finding a lifeboat. Because if this is the best our country can do, pretty soon all of us are going to be taking on water, and not just from Hunter's Bond. Be sure to listen to Fox Across America with me, Jimmy Fallon, weekdays from noon to 3 on the Fox News app and foxacrossamerica.com. You've been listening to the Fox News Rundown. And now, stay up to date by subscribing to this podcast at foxnewspodcasts.com. Listen ad-free on Fox News Podcasts Plus on Apple Podcasts. And Prime members can listen to the show ad-free on Amazon Music. And for up-to-the-minute news, go to foxnews.com. Hey, it's Will Kane, co-host of Fox & Friends Weekend. Join me as I share my thoughts on a wide range of topics, from sports and pop culture to politics and business. The Will Kane Podcast. Subscribe and listen now at foxnewspodcasts.com or wherever you get your podcasts.